Welcome to LA Interview. My name is Joseph R. Millis. This week's guest is Joan Carl, an amazing, talented sculptor with a large body of work that also includes paintings and drawings. That's Joan Carl next on LA Interview. Welcome to LA Interview, Joan. Very happy to have you here. I am very happy to be here. Good, good. It's lovely, comfortable. Well, you're welcome. And uh, I like your blue shirt. Oh, I like your blue. <laughs> I like your blue shirt too, and our 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 we pants, do, everything we matches. Well. We're so coordinated. <laughs> By the way, we didn't talk about this, so we did not arrange this ahead of time. So. Nope. No. So, Joan, um, at what point in your early youth or uh, years did you know that you wanted to be a sculptor and an artist in general? Well, the artist came out early. Early. Yeah. I, I drew everything that was in my room, from little figurines to my desk to the trees outside. From the time I was about seven or eight, by nine I was handed some clay, some plastiline, oil-based clay. Right. And I made my little figure of my dog, <laughs> a wire hair fox terrier. Oh, nice. And the gal who gave it to me was so excited by what I had done. She took it home and made a mold and poured a plaster and brought me back two and showed me how to finish it to make it look like bronze. Oh, wow. That must have been quite a discovery it, for it you. It was wonderful. Must have... It was just wonderful. Yeah. In fact, this, this gal, who was in a uh, writing class with my mother, I mean, she was a youngster then, and my mother was... My mother. Right. And I met her again out here. I was at the uh, Henry Moore show. I mean, where else would a sculptor go? Right, exactly. And I was with somebody else from Cleveland, where I was born, who said, Joan, I want you to meet somebody. And this little lady, about five feet one, turns around and looks at me, and I look at her, and I said, I don't need an introduction to Helene Blum. I know who Helene this person Blum. is. <laughs> Do you know? Right. I, I just said, and Helene looked at me. Um, I said, you wouldn't know me as Joan Carl, but you would as Joan Strauss. Right. And we fell into each other's arms. Of course. How wonderful. And Full circle. I saw her on again, off again, until she died a year and a half ago at the age of 101. Oh, God bless her. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. What a great story. Yeah. Great story. And, and uh, I'm still sculpting. You're still sculpting, doing wonderful, too. Thank you. And so your education, uh, artistic education? Uh, private studies with, uh, God, I've forgotten her name, early, early on. And then the Cleveland School of Art, some... Before that, the museum, they had children's programs. Children's program, right, right. I read and then that. Cleveland School of Art for, and Western Reserve University, splitting the two. For a degree, I had to have four years of work, of art, and four years at the university packed into five years. Wow. And I told my folks, no way. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm not doing justice right. to either one. Right. I wanted to go to the Chicago Art Institute. And that's where you went? That's where I went. And then and from there? I met my husband. Oh, is that? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, the good thing you went there then. The day I arrived. Oh, wow. And um, we were engaged 10 days later. <laughs> wow, God, that's great. <laughs> it lasted 47 years. 47 years, years so was, yeah. you had good instincts. Yeah. <laughs> but I still went back any time I was in Chicago. I traveled with him. I see. And during those travels, of course, I couldn't sculpt. Right. In hotel rooms, etc. But I could draw and I could paint. There you go. And I've got a lot of sketches from those days. And uh, then we landed in Portland, Oregon. And I went back and studied with two people, a couple. The sculptor was the woman and the painter, the man. 
and uh, Carl and Hilda Morris. They were wonderful. And I did a lot of drawing. And that, you know, that's like scales to a pianist or right, any right. instrumentalist or a singer. Right. And uh, I, I don't think a day goes by, even today, that I don't draw something. Right. And I've spoken to other artists who uh, are sculptors mm -hmm. who tell me that the drawing is very important oh, God, yeah. before sculpting so that you can have the form and, and the, and, and the well, shape. Well, you make it yours. You make it yours. <clears throat> but when, when you're drawing something, you're actually studying it and you're, you're, right. you're being it. Right, exactly. And it stays with you. It stays with you. So mm -hmm. then when you go to the stone or the wood... Uh, or anything. I mean, my, my head is, a <laughs> is, is a, like a photograph album. Oh, that's good. Well, that's important. Yeah. And when you, there's a statement in, in your biography where you say that you ask the wood or the stone to reveal its secrets. Yeah. And I, so my question was that, so do you ever start a sculpture without having any idea of what you're doing and ask yeah. the, the material to it's reveal a itself? It's a conversation. It's a conversation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. A lot of times because... I mean, you might even approach it with an idea that this is what you want. And, zap somewhere and then else. suddenly you look at it and you say, uh-uh, <laughs> no. if I turn it upside down... Then it's, it's more be, interesting. It's, it, and it says, wow, let's move. <laughs> let's move with that. Oh, yeah. That's great. The only time that I don't do that, I mean, it's verboten, is when I'm working on a commission. Oh, of course, right. And then you, you stay with as close to your original um, concept that you hand them, either right. as a drawing or a maquette. Right. So. so now, talking about your sculpture, I want to get to it right away. <laughs> you I'm like so my sculpture. I love your sculpture. It's just, <laughs> and the more I watch it, the more I fall in love with it. Um, right here, we start with Cold to Ulysses. Tell yeah. me about that. Well, that was one of the first of the larger stones that I tackled. That's about close to what, almost three feet? Three feet high, yeah. And uh, it's Italian white and it's part of a whole cache that I <laughs> I was lucky to get. Of, of, of marble? Of marble. I see. There was a stone yard going out of business and I was getting some equipment and they asked me if I needed more stone. And for a sculptor, that's like, that's like mana says, from heaven, right? Get over to Mustokina. Yeah. So I went over, and in those days, I bought a thousand dollars worth of stone for a hundred bucks. Oh my God! What a, that's a bargain. I was even offered stone that was, um, well, marble. Each piece was the size of two cars in length, and wow. one and a half, and one car in width, and two cars in height. I was offered them free. Oh, yeah, but where would you put them, right? <laughs> exactly. If I could move them. Right, if you could You move. needed a railroad car, et cetera. Right, that's... I laughed. Several I said, tons I'll of... I'll take this. <laughs> I'll, take a little, I'll take that little piece of the corner. <laughs> I still have some of that oh, stone. Oh, my God. That's wonderful. Still waiting for me to carve it. Well, I'm sure you're going to get to but it. But this one, I started out, and it sang. And it sang to you. And... Uh, I didn't name it, it just was, it, it was this group. Mm -hmm. So it was, a, it was part of other cult sculptures you were doing at the time? No, I, I don't know what I was doing at the time. I usually have more than one piece working well, at one time. working, yeah, which I know oh, yeah. that's how you work. Yeah. I have to. Good, good. You know, if, if you don't start something that you have the idea about, it never gets done. It never done. gets done, right? Never. Yeah. With anything, I guess, but, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, so um, my son, my son. My son, my son. Yeah. Um, those are two pieces from a very large piece that I um, broke off when I was carving it. And by the way, the stone itself, uh, there were three pieces shipped. And Anna Mahler 
and one other sculptor and I had chosen our pieces. When the piece was delivered, I was given the, the wrong one, but I was very happy. It's 3,000 pounds. 3,000, oh my God, wow. <laughs> that's the piece that is in the backyard that's nearly finished, but has a lot of the wonderful tool marks in it. That's right, I remember you yeah. were showing me that, right? Yeah. So these two pieces, uh, the base is the same as the, as the carving. Right. I left it rough. I left it unfinished uh, because his life was unfinished. Right, right. That's, this is about your son, right? That's right. It's the first carving I was able to do after he died. After he passed away. It took me almost four years. Four years. Yeah. I worked on commissions. I worked on a lot of other things. But on free carving, I couldn't do it. This next one is called Joshua. Mm -hmm. That's the first word of the title. Joshua made the sun stand still. Oh, wow. <laughs> and Joshua is like this. He's very, very adamant. That sun has to stay still. How big is this piece? That one is about four feet. Four feet. And it's unusual in that it was the first time that I took three pieces of marble and laminated them and oh, really? then carved them. Oh, wow. So you, you laminated, you mean you glue them together? I, I pinned them. You pinned them? With, with copper. Copper. And glued them. Okay. And uh, it fell over during the earthquake in 94. 94, yeah. Nothing happened. Nothing happened? Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's amazing. No. So yeah. tell me about this one. Uh, well, I found this piece in, of stone and I started to carve it, not knowing what it was going to do. I did, I did it, it just said mother and child, so I started. And I'm carving away and one whole chunk falls just off. Just falls out. And I looked at that. I didn't swear, I just <laughs> looked. I said, okay, now I know I have to be careful because right. it doesn't give you any warning. Right, every piece of stone is different. Oh right? boy, and how. It, it even smell different. Really? Yeah, black Belgian, it's beautiful. And it breaks, when you carve it, it breaks in conchoidal fractures like um, uh, obsidian. Okay. But it has a dank, <laughs> um, not even earthy, but an old cave smell oh, okay. <laughs> when, wow. when you're okay. carving it. This doesn't have a smell, but it sure had internal fractures that didn't show. And here's a second one. Um, Obviously. Mother and child. Yeah. Different, different. Uh, this is an outdoor uh, exhibit, right? Uh, no, it's still in my studio. Oh. Okay. I haven't finished it. I work outdoors. And, it was a beautiful uh, photograph. <laughs> thank you. I took it. Um, the mother and child on this one, they are, it's a strong peasant feeling. Yeah, and I can it's, see that. I'm leaving it rough except for the faces. Right. And I just haven't gotten around to polishing the faces. Well, it looks wonderful to me. <laughs> well, they, you know, sun carves beautifully. What do you mean by that? All right, when the sun hits it, yeah, and it it becomes different no matter where the sun is going. Right, right. You know, the the, the Greeks uh, described sculpture as light. Yeah, I can see that. I can That's why you, that. you don't you don't use a flash to take a picture of a of a sculpture. A sculpture. You just flatten it. Right. I mean, you have, uh, say, light. Middle tone right. and dark. Dark, right. So that's how you carve. Right. You carve to catch the light, which then creates the depth. Right. And so I love to photograph in the sun. In the sun. And when I'm working in the studio, if I'm doing a portrait, say, I move the lights around so, so that... you can see all the different f f phases right. of it. That's right. 
because there are times you, if, if I'm looking at you with a shadow on this side, and then I move this, and I find that there's a differentiation in the cheek structure. Right. You know, it's, it's fabulous. <laughs> it's it's three-dimensional, that's right. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, romance. Romance. <laughs> <laughs> that's an unusual piece of stone. Uh, it was given to me, and it's a form of onyx. Really? That I had never seen before. Hard. It was one of the first of the very hard stones. I always work with hard stones anyway. Hard wood, hard stones. Reason being, if you work with soft stones or soft wood, you can't get a bright line. That if you sand it, it kind of rounds off no matter what you do. I see. And I like the contrast between the hard and the soft, the bright line and the round. You know, you can't get that with, with the softer materials. No, you can't. Joan, you're such a prolific artist. Not only are you an amazing sculptor, but you're a wonderful painter. You draw, you do commissions. Let's talk a little bit about your, uh, your paintings. Well, this particular one that you have up is the last oil I did. Really? Mm -hmm. Between two worlds? I, start, I did this as a, I was teaching at the Valley Center of Arts, and I did this as a lecture demonstration, and it was a church that was being built at the time on White Oak. Oh, I see. In uh, Encino, I think. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and I did it completely representationally. I get it home and I'm looking at it and I say, I don't like this painting. <laughs> and, you know, there was, the, the ceiling wasn't completed. You could see the, the, the sky through it. And I started to simplify and blot out with uh, washes and things like that so that I got the feeling that I am between two worlds. Between two worlds. And I like that painting. I like it too. Very, very, very specific. Yeah. It's very simple. <laughs> that one I did this from is a blue. drawing. <laughs> I, I love. This is the one that I that I picked up right away. <laughs> well, that's not an oil. No, <clears throat> it's done in the way of the old-fashioned egg tempera. Egg tempera. Mm -hmm. I made my own gesso base, which means you. Paint it. You may make the gesso itself. You paint it on. on the you canvas. sand it down. You paint it on the opposite way. You sand it down till it's thick and like glass. Like glass. And you build up your colors. And I had seen this woman in Santa Barbara. Yeah, I, I love this story. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then I'll tell it. <laughs> and my mother and I were sitting there, and I said, "Mom, don't move." And I did a drawing oh, about this big. Two by four, like on a on a napkin or something. No, I had, had a little a piece of paper piece in my paper. in my uh, purse. And I said, just keep talking, and don't look around. So, we came back after that, and I had this gesso board all set up. Oh, good. And I thought, oh, great, and I painted her. Well, she was in a show one time, and somebody was standing there looking at it and looking at it. And I happened to be standing next to the individual. And he said, you're the painter? I said, yes. He said, did you do this in Santa Barbara? <laughs> I said, yes. Oh, I forgot to tell you. Right. right. Uh, I had said to my mom, just with these blue gloves and this blue hat and blue everything, I said, she looks like a madam. Right, right. <laughs> and the guy says to me, you were in Santa Barbara? I said, yeah. He said, you painted the madam. <laughs> <laughs> Lady was in business, and you could tell right away. That's funny. <laughs> I love that story. I love that story. Uh, that one, I this did, is, again, that's Latin beat. Yeah, that's great. Um, that is a quick sketch. Really quick? It looks... Yeah. Very detailed, like you spent, you know, no. several weeks working on it. Oh, no. 
That's fast painting. Fast painting. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. I did that again from a quick sketch. Quick sketch too. Yeah. Yeah. I had been to. You have a, a fantastic eye. Then it's like, it's like a photograph, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. Take a picture, and there it is. And this one, I like this one very much. Construction poet. Yeah. Well, What's he was a poet. What's the story behind that one? He was a poet. Uh, he was a model for Arnold Schifrin, who was a wonderful painter and a great friend. And I'd stop in once in a while when he had a class, and he had this model. And I did a, again, a little tiny sketch. <laughs> and I went home, and I had another board. That's a larger one. That's about uh, 40 by 30. And I painted him by memory, and from this little sketch. And I put the background in of uh, construction. Construction, yeah, I see the Because the he steel was a French. construction worker. He was a construction worker and a poet. Yeah, he was reading his poetry to the class. John, this one, Jerusalem. This, this is a big piece. Uh, Where yeah. is that sitting? In the sanctuary at a temple called Bat Yam, Daughter of the Sea, in Newport Beach. Newport Beach. Tell me about this. Well, first of all, it's only five inches deep. Oh, it looks like much, much more <laughs> uh, 3D than relief. It's that's because of the drawing. I see. It has a lot of depth and the to it. Cutting of the marble matching my drawing. Right. And it's twenty one feet across and fourteen feet. Fourteen high. feet. That's a big piece, yeah. Yeah. And each uh, there are etched into this into the marble are lines like the building of stone, of a stone wall. And matching that there are pieces of marble cut and to be placed on it within those rectangles right. with names of people who donate. Oh, I see. It's an honor wall. It's an honor wall. Mm-hmm. And, um, well, the, the curve, the arc. The arc. Yeah, that is symbolic of the one that is in Jerusalem. And it was the first temple that was ever built there. And during the War of Independence, the Arabs destroyed it. But the Ark is still there. The Ark is still there. Yeah. There you go. That's right. And That's right. And so I, I put that in. Now this piece, from generation to generation. Yeah. Well, that is placed in a place called Garvey Court. And I'm so thrilled because it is a an apartment building in El Monte, and it's built for uh, senior citizens and low cost. Low cost, wonderful. Plus the fact that it's an all green building. Everything about it, the water is reclaimed, everything. Wonderful. It That's is great. fabulous, and the people were so marvelous. They, <laughs> they asked me to, to make a, a little statement about it. And I think I told you it took me a week to write a few lines. <laughs> well, they put it on the that little on uh, the base. Yeah. Yeah, I see that. And the statement is there about generation to generation, which is perfect for that area. Right, sure. And they said by sculptor Joan, Joni, Carl. Carl. <laughs> because I always, you know, when when you're in business or something, and you're Sending notes back and forth, I put on the after the first note. I just said, "My friends call me Joni." Joni. Well, I I felt so good about that. Well, they obviously loved you. Yeah. And and of course. And they loved the piece. And the piece is wonderful, obviously. And it's seven feet. Seven feet. Yeah. And uh, very impressive. To see it in bronze, where you you see the lines and the textures rather than in Forton, which is fiber reinforced cement. Right. It's just a great thrill for me. Yeah, what well, beautiful piece. This one also uh, I find fascinating, Tosha. Tosha Seidel. This is a violin player, correct? Oh, yes. Was... And one day he, played, he posed for me. He and a group that would get together once every, every other Thursday in our living room 
play quartets. Oh my God. Tasha was one of the greats. He and um, Heifetz and... Yasha Heifetz? And, yeah, wow. all of them were a group. There were five. Tasha was one of the youngest. And they studied with Auer in Russia. Tasha was concertizing all over the world before he was 17. And one of those guys, huh? <laughs> and he was playing here in the studios. And, you know, that was when they, the studios were saying, we've got the best. We've got the best, and they did. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, by this time, he was getting up there. And his wife decided it was time to have quartets. And she called, can we have them in your living room? Of course. Every other week. Right. It was thrilling. Oh, I can imagine. What, to have a string quartet time. in your own house coming to play? Uh, and of the tops. Right. So we were in, I told him I wanted to do a portrait. He said, fine. Yeah. You know, he's a little guy with a leonine head. <laughs> and he started playing while I was working. And this is just a little over life size. I almost well, I built it a little over life size, and then when it was fired, it's clay. Um, and it shrinks a it little sh bit. Yeah. And one day he says, he's looking at the uh, hand on the on the neck of the violin. He says, "I'm playing an E flat." <laughs> <laughs> and then he takes his bow, which is a six thousand dollar bow, and puts it into the hand of the uh, of the clay, and it fit. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> I said, Tasha, you. Not, not with that bow. No, because... And then he started to play. And he played a Bach air, the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto, the Brahms Violin Concerto, and ended up with the Beethoven Concerto. Oh, my God. And he would stop, and you knew he was hearing the music. The whole piece in his head. Well, I... I put my my work down. I could yeah, not. How could you? How could I, you I continue couldn't. working with? It was just so thrilling. And later I just said, Tasha, I feel guilty. <laughs> why? He says, why? <laughs> I said, because I'm the only one hearing this. He says, I don't play for people. <laughs> what a character. That one is, is in the Magnus Museum up in Berkeley. Wow, it's wonderful. Uh, and here's one more. Dr. Barry Schifrin, another yeah. wonderful bust. Uh, this is also quite uh, uh, outstanding and it's re realistic. Oh, yeah. And, and, and it seems to me you also capture this gentleman's I did. energy and personality. And he is a sweetheart. He's brilliant. Uh, he's a uh, surgeon. Um, uh, he operates on, on uh, infants in the womb. I see. Oh, prenatal. Uh, pre prenatal, prenatal surgeon. Pre pre thank you. Prenatal cardiologist. Cardi oh, wow. And, That's a quite a specialty. Oh, yeah. And just a lovely guy. And his wife commissioned this. And it was going to be a surprise. And then I said, look, I don't want to work from photographs. Right, right. And I had photographed him and all. And so he came and sat. But before he did, I built the head, just just the the basic. The basic shape. And when he was there, I said, you know, Barry, let me try something. And I took my calipers, and I oh, measured. Yeah. I was right on the dollar. Right on the dollar? <laughs> and the, as pretty... I was working and getting close to finishing, he's standing there looking at himself. He says, it's very strange to see myself looking back at myself. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine that would be a, a natural reaction for most people. It was the first time I ever tried to <laughs> sculpt a beard. <laughs> That's right. Yes, a slight a little beard. It was, it was fun. It was fun to work with. I'm sure. Well, Joan, unfortunately we're running out of time. No. <laughs> and wish we had like an hour to go because you have such a body of work no. uh, but unfortunately uh, we've come to the end of the show but thank you so much for coming 
Thank you for asking me and, to do this. And we'll have you back some other time. Great. And we'll, we'll talk, start from we'll and start go on. From, and go on for the rest of your stuff. <laughs> thank you so much. Hey, sweetie, thank you. You're welcome. This has been fun. Me too. If you would like more information about Joan Carl's artwork, you can visit her website at www.joancarl.com. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next week on LA Interview.